morning. We did. Chris has hers. Did anybody else bring their Bibles today? If you, Trevor, of course, there, there's Vicky. Uh, we're going to look in the Word of God today. Hopefully, by now, you know what scripture we are looking at. It's, Sean guessed it, but I, I, I thought, you know, Sean is pretty brilliant, so Sean would probably understand. But this is the third week and the third and final week in our series, my series anyway, talking about worship. And who would have thought for three weeks you could have preached from the same verse of scripture? In fact, I think you could probably do more. Did you forget to unplug yourself, Dale? That's all right. No one's looking at you. We're just going to wait for the scripture to come up on the screen. Don't look at Dion. He's probably a bit embarrassed as he is. There's the scripture. John 4, 23 to 24. Does anybody know what this scripture is off by heart? It's all right. You can't, if you don't. There you go. Dion knows. Anybody else know? You want to have a crack? Uh, he's going to come up on there, Sean, and we can all read it together. Let's read this all together. This is, this is two verses. This is the first verse. Are you ready to read it? All right, let's read this out loud and go. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Well done. So if you're taking notes today, and hopefully you are, this third message is entitled, Life is Worship. Who remembers what we talked about in the first week? like a little pop quiz, and that was a bit hard because Pastor Kevin came after that. The first one we talked about was a mind to worship. The second one we talked about, which was last week, hopefully that's a little more fresh in your memory, was a heart for worship. And then today we're talking about worship is, or life is worship. When you think about it, it's head, heart, and hands. The first time we talked about a mind to worship, we were talking about engaging our mind when we were worship, so using our head. Last week we talked about our heart, having a heart for worship, and today we're talking about our hands when it comes to worship because our life is worship or it should be. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, it's so good to come together. It's so good to be here with all these men, women and children, all Jesus followers, people who love you, Lord. And God, we just come around your word today knowing, Lord, that we are imperfect knowing that we have so much to learn, knowing, God, that your word can teach us so much. And we pray today, Lord, that each of us would have ears open to hear what your spirit is saying to us this morning. God, I pray that any of my words would fall to the ground and just your words from heaven, Lord, would be spoken this morning. We pray that every person would take something away from the message today, both those here and face to face and those online as well. We give you all the praise this morning. We give you all the glory. And everyone who agrees said? Amen. Amen. So we know that when we think about our Christian faith, one way that we've been talking about is to break it down into three parts. So our head, our heart, and our hands. If you're into alliteration, you would like that. Our head, what we know, what we believe, and what we think about God. That's what our head is. Our heart is our love, our affection for, and our surrender to God. We talked about this last Sunday in worship, and we practice this, if you remember, at the end of the service. But our hands and what we do is what must come out of our life. People must see, not that you just attend church and that you worship God, but that on Monday to Saturday, you actually live a life of worship, that your hands do things that people would say, oh, I see now. They don't just attend church. It's not just lip service. They believe what they know and they do something. I know our banner up the back there says, we are a church that love God and love people, and we believe in showing it so that people actually see that we believe in our God. And here is a little secret for you this morning. Most of us have a major. In one of those areas, you will be stronger 
then another. One of you, and then you will have a minor, one that's maybe not so strong, but it's, a, it's the middle one. And then we all have one we can work on. And you might be sitting next to someone this morning, someone in your family, someone you're married to, and it might be very easy for you to identify the one that they are strong in. And then maybe the one they're not so strong in, but don't tell them the one that they lag in. Maybe just ask yourself, Lord, which is the one that I need to work on the most? It's the way that you were made. Some of us were actually made, and we're just good at one of those things or another. In fact, all of us are strong in one area and probably need to work on others. What would you say this morning is your spiritual strength? Do you have a really good head knowledge of God? Do you have a real heart to worship God? Or if people see you, would they say, man, that is an acts of service kind of person. They're always doing things for people. It's very obvious that they love God by what they do with their hands. The truth is all of us need to get better at all things. When we worship God with our head, that means we think great thoughts about God. Our head is good. We know the word of God. The people here this morning, you know the word of God inside out. You can quote scriptures, oftentimes verbatim. You know the scripture inside out. And because of that head knowledge, you love God. Because you know the scripture. You have a great head knowledge. But I would put it to you this morning that what good is a head knowledge if it doesn't actually transfer to your hands and you do something? It's also great. The second thing is we can worship God with our heart and our affections. It's it's awesome. On a Sunday, if you're just lost in worship and you're just here in the presence of God and there's nowhere else you want to be, but on a Monday when your neighbor is sick, did you go to the supermarket and get them something? Did you buy them some lemons? Did you make them some soup? Did you do something physically with your hands that they would say, wow, that person actually puts their faith into practice? And this is a challenge for all of us this morning. When we worship God with our hands, we show by what we do that our God is worth living for because the relationship we have with God teaches us that other people are to be honored and valued, and we should serve the fellow men around us. Today I'll be asking the question of you and me, how am I worshipping God with my life? And is that obvious to people around me? I want to talk about a great man of God in the Bible today. You probably know him. His name was David. He was one of the greatest worshippers of all time. There's a lot of scriptures about David. In fact, he's probably one of those people that I'd love to meet when I go to heaven. Most of the Psalms were written by David. Most of the Psalms are worship. They're poems, obviously, but it's worship. It's words of worship that we sing to God. One of the things that we love about David is he had a heart for God that was the size of the sun. Everybody knew that David had a heart of worship. He had a heart after God. He loved God. He wanted to serve God. Not only was David that guy that was a great leader with a big heart, but he was also a leader that was happy to get his hands dirty. David just didn't sit on his throne and say, well, I'm just going to give orders to everybody else to do things. He actually did things himself. And we too, like David, are called to serve God. King David, David figured out how to serve God. Obviously, there was a head knowledge. Obviously, there was a heart knowledge. But that went beyond that. And David used his hands, what he was given, the gifts he was given, to serve God. And that's our first point this morning. God calls me to serve. Each of us are called to serve him. We are called to worship God with our hands. Hopefully you're keeping up with me this morning and I haven't lost you on the path some way. David served in worship to God in one of the most difficult ways. While King Saul was failing as a king, David was being secretly anointed as king. 
And while David watched King Saul fail, he was patiently waiting for his turn to be king. David didn't sit on the sidelines though, he served. He did something. He was working with his hands. David was willing to get his hands dirty. Yes, he thought great things about God. He knew great things about God. He passionately worshipped his God. But did you also know that David killed so many of Israel's enemies? He was a man that actually got his hands dirty. David's reputation among the people, even before he became king, was that he was a savage. People knew that about him. Like, this man is savage. In war, he was a cold-blooded killer. And he was comfortable with the slaughter of wartime violence. He didn't just sit in his throne giving out orders and commands. David himself was on the front line. This savage warrior who is also considered one of the greatest worshippers of God. David knew that part of his worship to God was to use his hands, was to get his hands dirty. So how did he serve so well in such a difficult circumstance. So we don't currently live in a time like King David did. No one requires you to go to the front line now and to kill all your enemies. It was a bit different. So how did he serve so well in such difficult circumstances? David made a decision that God's kingdom was more important than his kingdom. And he was willing to serve him. David knew that God's glory was more important than his glory. Remember, he was a king. He was an earthly king. He understood royalty. He understood order. He understood commands. And he also understood, I am but an earthly king. And there is a heavenly king, the king of the earth, as we know. David knew that God receiving worship through service was more important than any inconvenience that serving would bring. And so the question to each of us this morning is, will you serve him, God? The challenge for you today and for me is to take your passion and your knowledge of God, your head knowledge and your heart knowledge, and to use that to inform your actions in serving him with your hands. Because if you read the Bible, you will start to learn who God is, what God says, and all of a sudden you will realize, I have been given gifts and talents and abilities for a reason. God wants me to use them. And part of the way that you use them that I would say is very important is here in a local church. Some of you have been given an incredible gift of hospitality, and I was very tempted to use names today, but I won't. But there are people in our church who've been given a gift of hospitality who most of you would have no idea. Bring morning tea on a Sunday. Nobody knows. There's no glory. And I heard this person say last week, I'm so thankful that God gave me a gift of hospitality. Now, that person doesn't preach out the front. You, don't, you may not, this person is here today, and I'm not going to make eye contact on purpose. But people who have a gift from God who understand it's to serve him. And you can use a gift of hospitality in your church on a Sunday, but you can use it Monday through Saturday in your community, with your family, with your neighbors, with all of those people around you. We had no idea yesterday that when we took a loaf of bread and some lemons to our next door neighbor that she would message me today and say, we are unwell. And to see a bag of lemons at the door meant we were able to make a honey and lemon tea that we would not have had if our neighbor hadn't dropped some lemons off. Did I know they were sick? No, I did not. I just knew that somebody had given us some huge bags of lemons, and we thought, how can we get these around to people? Certainly winter is a good time to give people lemons. It's just a way of serving your neighbors serving people around you. The challenge is for us is to take our knowledge of God. What does God say about me? What gifts has God given me? And how can I serve people around me? You can be a person who is strong and powerful and full of love for God. 
and also be someone who is a person of spiritual action, that they go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. Do you know after becoming king, David's work with his hands didn't stop? Who brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? The hint was in the question. It was David. David established Jerusalem not only as the capital of the nation, but as the center of worship of the nation. The Ark of the Covenant, where God presided at the time, was not in Jerusalem yet. The Ark of the Covenant was in a tent in Obed-Edom's backyard. And David had to go and get it. David personally went to get the ark of God. And there was a huge parade and there was blood and sacrifice and they had to stop every few steps. It was huge. And the scriptures will teach you about this parade if you're not sure. Just read 2 Samuel. It says in 2 Samuel 6 verse 15, So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of of the horn. You know, as the ark entered Jerusalem, David outwardly celebrated the splendor of God. You know, you would have heard this before, I'm sure, the scripture that says, or the song that says, and I will dance like David danced. A mighty king who humbled himself and danced before his king. As he brought the ark of the covenant in, there was leaping and dancing as he himself led the procession Then at the resting place in Jerusalem, David offers more burnt offerings to God. David could have sat in his palace on his comfortable throne and ordered all the ones around him to go and do it. That's what a king does. You have the authority to send people. But no, David himself got out there. He walked with his people and he led the way. What a leader. David worshipped God with his hands and his life. And he got the job done. There are some of you here today who are naturally doers. You've been given the gift of acts of service. You've been given the gift of taking action. You're great at getting your hands on things and getting things done. That is, in fact, a gift from God. And you are called to use it. What if David had not served? What if he had ignored the call to serving people around him? Well, the borders of the country would never have been secure. The ark of God would have never made it to Jerusalem. And later in 2 Samuel, we see that God gave David the vision for the building of the temple. These things, I don't know, would have happened if David didn't use his hands to serve God. And the God that we all love and serve calls his people, which is us, to worship him with action. It's not enough just to attend church on a Sunday, pay your lip service and go home. God calls you to a life of worship so that people would see you and say, wow, there is something truly different about that person. We're not called just to be consumers of spiritual experience, but we're called to be people who worship God through doing, through actions. Just do something, as people say. Do you know, doers make a true impact for God's kingdom. People who actually do something, see a need and do something. You know, when I was young, a few years ago now, we had a really great youth pastor and and people would say to him, I just don't know what to do with my life. I don't know how I should serve in the church. I, I just don't know. Well, what is it? What are my gifts? What should I do? And he used to say to them, just start somewhere. Do something. And the way that he would base that on, it was easier to steer a moving car than a stationary one. So somebody that would go and say, look, I just want to have a crack at kids' church. I want to give it a go. I want to see how I go. And they may not have lasted very long in there for whatever reason. And then they could shift and say, but I really liked working with people, maybe just not kids. And so they might shift over to the cafe for a little while and realize this is actually really good, but it just doesn't really suit my hours. But then all of a sudden, they're a part of the hospitality team that cooks meals through the week because that suits their time. It suits their gift. And they can bring those meals into the church to bless people in need. So they've gone on this journey of, I'm started here and I might go here and I'll try over here and I'll I'll try all these things. You know, there are so many areas in our church that we need people to fill. 
It would be, if we sat down here today, we could write a massive list and say, these are all the things that need to be done in our church. As it stands at the moment, there's a lot of gaps, not because we don't have the people. We have a lot of people. Maybe not today. There's people unwell in a way. But a church of 120 people should not struggle with some of the things that we struggle with. And the truth of that is, is that there are people in this church who are sitting on a gift and you're not using it. And this is not supposed to be a condemnation on anybody because some of you might honestly say, I didn't know the church needed that. I didn't know I could help in that way. I didn't know that I could do things behind the scenes. Maybe Sundays don't work for you. Maybe you've got time during the week. I know that Andrea would love people to come out during the week and look at the gardens, pull a few weeds, mow a few lawns, do whatever it is. There's so many things in the church that need to be done that aren't yet being done, but who I believe if we can all rise up in a heart of worship and say, I didn't even realize that mowing lawns for the church was worship. Wow, I'm going to write my hand down to do that. Or maybe you look at it and say, I didn't know that we needed more people to do food on a Sunday. Probably a real need that the church actually has is to fill a freezer with meals for people in need. Especially coming into winter, the church will receive more requests of people that need meals. In fact, I know that Sarah's watching this morning and we need to all give Sarah a huge congratulations. She had a little baby boy on Friday. Congratulations, Sarah. Um, Sarah and Charlotte, if you're not quite sure, they had a little baby boy. And I was talking to Andrea about this, and I hope this is not a spoiler alert for you, Sarah, but we would like to get some meals to Sarah. So if you live locally and you can help do that, because with a toddler and a baby, it's pretty full on. She's also recovering from surgery. We would like to bless her with meals. So if you're able to help with that, please let me know after the service. This is a practical way of serving people around us. You know, James asks this question in James 2... Verse 14, he says, What good is it if you claim to have faith, but it doesn't come out in serving? The answer, it's not good at all. It's a worthless faith. It's interesting, the Bible says, how, what's the point of being somebody that just knows all about God? This is my paraphrase, by the way. Someone who talks about things and has a big, loud voice, but has no love for people around him. He is nothing but a clanging symbol. And I don't know if you've ever heard a clanging cymbal, they just give you a headache. It's one of those things that I often think people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so rather than quoting scripture all the time, why don't we live a life that says, what are the needs around me and how can I help? You know, one of the most powerful examples that we ever saw was people who went to a school and didn't just say, we are the heroes, we are the Pentecostal church, We will come here and fix your school. But instead came in and humbled himself and said to the principal, hey, we've got a pretty big church. In other words, a big army of people. How can we bless your school? What does your school need? How can we help your school? I think that principal thought, no one's ever asked me what I need. Everyone just tells me what I need. But how amazing would it be for a church to just bless its community in such a way like that? That would be pretty amazing. We don't want to have a worthless faith. God has called us to worship him with our hands and actually do something. My second point this morning, and I only have two points, and that's hard to believe, is we actually worship God by getting back up after spiritual failure. I know some of you know the full story of David, and maybe some of you don't. Who remembers when David failed? Dismally. David had wandering eyes, and David found a lady called Bathsheba one day, and David did something he shouldn't have done, and not just that, he had Bathsheba's husband killed. Not only was he an adulterer, he was also a murderer. That's pretty big things. We know that David failed, but he repented and he got back up again. And there's some interesting things you can take away from that because when you get back up after falling into sin, your life says three things. The first thing says, I was wrong and God's holiness matters. I was wrong. It's good for people to hear you say, I was wrong. 
The second thing is, the God that we serve is loving, he is merciful, and he is gracious. And if people see you fall and then come back up again, they must say, wow, this God that they serve is not getting ready to smite them, but instead is getting ready to welcome them back in, if we have a heart of repentance. And the third thing is, he is worth turning to and living for, that's God. If people see you rise back up from sin to say, I was wrong, I did the wrong thing and I repent for that, and my God is worthy of my first and my best and I admit that I'm a human and I fail, we all do, but God is worthy and he is worth turning to and living for. Do you know, turning back to God when we have failed is worship. Why? Because it makes a statement to the people around us about his worth and what he is worthy of. The Bible actually says to all of us that we are all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The reason that we are sitting here today is we have simply come across the King of Kings who so lovingly sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us so that we didn't have to pay the price for our sin because he knew that we couldn't pay the price for our sin. And one of the ultimate signs of worship is to actually come before him and say, Jesus, I repent. I was wrong and I'm sorry. And your holiness, God, matters. In closing this morning, maybe if the team could come back up, Maybe you are that person that needs to turn from the sin that is ruining your life and find forgiveness in Jesus. If you are a Christ follower and you are here this morning, would you confess the Lord, would you confess to the Lord your sin and come back to him? Maybe if you, there is a sin that's haunting you. We talked about this last week that some people struggle in the presence of God. And as I have personally experienced myself, it's because we have an area of sin. And we often, whether we don't see it or we choose not to see it, but I remember speaking to this prophet who said to me, there is an area of sin in your life and you just need to ask God what it is and deal with it. And all of a sudden I did, and then I could worship freely once again. Sin gets in the way. It will always get in the way. In fact, the Bible says that sin actually separates you from God. If you have never before trusted Jesus as your savior, I know that he would love you to come to faith in him. Maybe you attended kids' church as a child, maybe you made a decision, maybe you didn't. But the Bible actually says that today is the day of salvation. Maybe you're sitting here today or you've been sitting here for a few weeks and you're hearing about this God that we worship and we have this head knowledge. And we have this heart knowledge. And now we're talking about actually doing something. This is your opportunity to do something, is to say yes to Jesus. Is there a stirring in your heart this morning? Because if there is, what that is, is God is drawing you to himself. He's drawing you to his love. He's drawing you to his forgiveness. Did you know that Jesus died for your sins? And when we took communion this morning, that's what we were remembering, that Jesus died at the cross and he rose again. And as that old cliche says, even if you were the only person left on planet Earth, he still would have done it. Because the Bible says that he so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish. You know, it's no accident that you're here this morning. If online you're hearing this message, it's no accident. God is a God of order. He ordains things. He is a God of seasons. If you're hearing this message today, it's because God wanted you to hear this message. And I believe whenever we come to a message, there should be a response. And so I wonder this morning, if you could just bow your head, close your eyes, just in privacy to people around you, just to give us all time to think this morning. Give us time to say, Lord, is there an area of sin that's hindering me from worshiping you? Is there an attitude that I've been harboring? Is there something I've been doing 
intentionally that I should not have been. Remembering that we need to be humble enough to come and say, God, I was wrong and your holiness matters. To remember this morning that we are standing, or as you are, sitting on holy ground. Give yourself some time this morning to reflect and to look at your heart. The scripture says, search my heart and make it clean, O God. Lord, would you speak to us this morning? Are there areas of sin that we need to fix? Are there areas, God, that we need to deal with? Attitudes, pride, lust, greed. What is it for you, church? What is it in your heart? Maybe maybe it's not. Maybe you've dealt with everything and you're just here and, and you are here with clean hands and a pure heart to worship your God, and that is awesome. Maybe you're here today, though, and you wouldn't actually say that you are yet a follower of Jesus. You've never actually made that decision to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. You know, it's one thing to go to church. It's very nearly another to call yourself a believer. Anyone can go to church, but not everybody has called upon the name of Jesus. So just as we're all here this morning, having our own little conversation with Jesus, if you are here today and you have never said yes to Jesus, it would be my privilege to pray with you and for you this morning. How do you know if this is for you? Well, your heart's going pretty quick and you can feel that real pulling in your spirit. God is tapping on the door of your heart today saying, hey, today is the day of salvation. Would you accept me? And the coolest thing about all of this is we're not just going to pray with you and send you on your merry way, but somebody will meet up with you. Somebody will disciple you. Somebody will talk with you. Somebody will teach you. Somebody will give an example of what it means to live a life as a Christian. So I'm going to ask now, just while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, if there's someone here this morning that wants to say yes to Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I would love to pray with you this morning. Who is that person? Maybe there's more than one that needs to say yes to Jesus this morning. We'll wait for you this morning. Give thanks, Jesus. We give thanks, Lord, that you're speaking to people's hearts this morning. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can open your eyes, church. <clears throat> We're going to sing again this morning in worship to our God. And I want you to pray while we sing this morning and say, God, how can I better serve you? How can I better serve this community of faith? Yes, but how can I better serve people around me? How can I actually use my worship with my hands as service to people that I love? We've, we've long since discovered, and I hope that you caught up with this somewhere along the way, that worship is not the slow songs that we sing on a Sunday. That's part of it indeed. But that's the tip of the iceberg. We're called to live a life of worship so that people would look and say, wow, man, God is good. Lives that are wholly surrendered to Him. Marriages that people go, man, I want a marriage like that or I want a family like that or I want a, a business like that or I want to be like that person. So would you stand to your feet this morning? We're going to sing again. And I believe every message requires a response. And I would love you just to lift your hands in surrender and say, Jesus, I want to respond to this message this morning. God, would you search my heart and show me, Lord, speak to me, God. Am I using my gifts to the capacity that I should be? Or God, could I be doing more? Could I be loving more? Could I be helping more? Could I be serving more? Not to force yourself into burnout and you can't earn your salvation. You can't earn anything. But what it is, is you're empowered by the grace of God to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to commit to something. I'm actually going to commit, get a bit of a concrete spirit about myself, commit to doing something either in the house of God or the community, but to use your gifts to honour the King of Kings in worship, in worship. 
You know, there's people here today and you've been given an incredible gift of hospitality. And by hospitality, I mean you are good with food, but you are good with people. And you are needed in the house of God like never before. People need a warm handshake. People need a warm muffin after the service. People need a hot coffee. People need physical, tangible things to show them how much God loves them. Maybe during the week you say, you know, I, I could cook some stuff, man. I could make some soups or I could make some curries. You know, it's so simple. If you're making your family a batch of soup, just do times two, make one for the church and bring it in. Pray over that thing and say, God, this soup is to go to a family and bless them, God. That somebody would know the nourishment, not just of a warm meal, but what it is to be loved by you, Jesus. What gifts do you have, church? Maybe you're a tradie, maybe you're a mechanic, and you could say, God, I'm gonna to commit to servicing one car a month for someone in need. I won't expect anything in exchange for that. I just wanna bless someone. What gifts do you have, church? What is in your hand? And you might say, not much. But I tell you this this morning, that if you place your not much into the hands of God, Scripture shows over and over and over again that a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread can feed thousands. Because when your faith meets with God, man, miracles happen. Never think what is in your hand is insignificant or doesn't matter. Maybe some of you are great at growing produce and you can bless people around you with that. Maybe some of you don't like talking to people yet, but you could wash the kids' church shirts or you could wash the tea towels for the kitchen or you could wash and iron the tablecloths. It's using your gifts to honour God. What is God calling you to do this morning? God, we just want to respond this morning with a heart of worship. Lord, that each of us would rise up to the call before us. God, what is it that you want us to do to practically serve this church, but to practically love the community around us? Holy Spirit, we pray for creative ideas. God, that you would just drop them in people's spirits. God, that people would get downloads from heaven this morning. Maybe you can babysit for someone. Maybe you can wash someone's car, whatever it is. Nothing is insignificant. Come on, we're going to worship this morning. Let's lift our holy hands to heaven. He is worthy of our praise.